So thank you for coming today to the Conservation Education Lunch and Learn. Today we're having a really exciting and special topic, um, a panel discussion, which is always fun because we get to hear from a lot of different backgrounds and experiences um, across the state. Um, so today we're talking about cultural and historical interpretation. And we have some phenomenal speakers um, here with us to be lending their experience and their expertise and their thoughts on this really important topic. Um, if you are new to the Conservation Education uh, Lunch and Learn series, just a little bit of background on what that is, um, if you haven't joined us before. So um, conservation education or education is an essential part of conservation, understanding how people learn and what motivates conservation based behavior changes are complex subjects that span across many different scientific disciplines and this series aims um, to really dive into the science behind a lot of those educational efforts and practices and by learning from experts and having these types of panel discussions and hearing from a variety of different science and topics. Um, so I will be recording this session today and so anyone joining us today, I will be sending a follow up email um, with any resources that we chatted about today and the contact information of our lovely panelists. And also you will be getting a link to the recording as well um, if you would like to pass it along or watch it again and also an evaluation to see um, what you thought and also what kind of new topics you might want to see in 2023 for this series. So with that, I will get started. We have some great questions to get through today. I do appreciate any uh, participants who added their questions when they registered. We had some really good ones. We'll be sure to get to those. And we have some um, pre-curated uh, pre questions as well for the panelists. So we will just get started by asking the panelists to go ahead and Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your current role you play in cultural and historical interpretation here in Nebraska. And then I, I can have, um, how about Susan? Would you like to start? Sure. Okay. Hi, my name is Susan Cook. I'm currently the superintendent at Niagara National Scenic River. So Valentine, Nebraska is where I'm at. Um, and I spent 28 years at Homestead National Historical Park outside of Beatrice, Nebraska. Uh, so I've worked with the National Park Service for a long time, and that's a lot of what we do is we are looking, we constantly look at the cultural, the historical, and the scientific and the natural aspects of any of the places that we're protecting. So right now I get to manage the people who are doing it all and to, to dream up the ideas and looking at different ways of doing it. Excellent. Thank you, Susan. I love the background. It's, it's, it helps I to visualize it. where you're from. Yeah. <laughs> Amanda, would you like to go? I'm Amanda Philby, um, an outdoor education specialist with Nebraska Game of Parks. I'm in the Parks Division and I'm located out in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Um, I have a CIG certification with the National Association for Interpretation and I'm also a CIGT, so I'm an instructor um, for the Certified Interpretive Guide training. Um, thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Forgot to mention that. Oh, sweet. Look at that. Um, Autumn. Hi, my name is Autumn Langmeyer, and I am working with History Nebraska right now at our HQ. I am the Historic Marker Equity Program Coordinator, and basically our program is um, just designed as an offshoot of the regular Historic Marker Program um, to make it possible for uh, communities and groups that have previously not had a lot of success in being a part of our Historic Marker Program um, to get that accessibility and the attention that they deserve so we can get those gaps filled in in our historical narrative that we're telling with our roadside markers. Excellent. Thanks, Autumn. I just went on a road trip through the Sand Hills last weekend to get to South Dakota, and I stopped to every marker. And I just, it's like, I don't know about anyone else, but that's part of my road trip experience. So I appreciate those history, history markers. Um, Tamara? Hey, Tamara Cooper. Um, and I work with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Um, I am currently the superintendent at Ash Hollow State Historical Park. Um, Ash Hollow is on the National Register of Historic Places for the Oregon Trail, um, but we do interpret about 10,000 years worth of history. Um, Ash Hollow as a place has a lot. Um, I came to the agency previously. Um, I was a history teacher. I have my master's degree in history. Um, interpretation is a little bit new to me, um, but really enjoying it so far and, and loving Ash Hollow. 
Excellent. Thanks, Tamara. And I like your background too. That's excellent. And Ashley, go ahead and introduce yourself. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley Anderson. I am the Curator of Education at History Nebraska. So I work with Autumn. And uh, as you can see, we have Chimney Rock behind me. So History Nebraska encompasses not only the Nebraska History Museum in Lincoln, uh, that's where I'm based out of currently, but we also include Fort Robinson, Chimney Rock, the Norris House uh, down in McCook and Neely Mill up in Neely. So even though I'm based out of Lincoln, I am a statewide educator and I've worked in museum education for about 11 years now. So I'm thrilled to be in Nebraska and uh, talking about history and interpreting its different uh, stories. Excellent. Thank you so much. What an um, exciting like wealth of knowledge we have here today. So I appreciate that. Um, we'll just get right into one of our first questions and which is how would you define cultural and historical interpretation? You know, especially if you're thinking about folks outside of this field, what, how do you explain what that is or what the work that you do is to people outside of this field? And anyone who'd like to go, you just start kind of going back and forth between yourselves, so. I do have one simplistic way of looking at it. I feel it's about the people. It's where we, with cultural and history, Anything we have, I have this beautiful river or at Homestead was the prairie in that story, but it's connecting the stories all back to the people. And when you start connecting to people, other people can, can connect to that same story too. Yeah, that's excellent. I would also agree with Susan and I would say that um, historical interpretation in particular is about making information relatable to people, um, showing them why it matters and how they are connected to the bigger picture that we're looking at. And uh, to bounce off of Autumn, and part of what I do is somebody who works with audiences uh, as young as, you know, pre-K and lifelong learners, it's, it's taking that history and that the story of people and taking it kind of out, out of that ivory tower of history and uh, bringing it to, to the everyday person. So making those connections are essential and so important. And I would add that to um, how it differs, differs from, you know, a, a typical education is because there's not an objective that everybody has canned, but everybody needs to learn. Um, history is very personal. Um, and if you can relate to one person or give them new information, um, and the interpretive piece really is allowing them to grow with the information that you provide them in their own way. Mm -hmm. History is personal. I like that. Yeah. Excellent. Um, kind of related this question, and some of you kind of spoke on it a little bit, but maybe let's dive a little deeper. What do you think the value of telling cultural and historical stories are, or is, is in our society? What's the value of those, of both of those stories in our society today? Yeah, that's a big question, isn't it? Well, I'll jump in, you know, we don't know where we're going to go if we don't know where we've been. Mm. And so if we want to understand where we are today, we have to look back at what shaped it, what is it all about? And that's where controversy comes in too, because when you start looking at both sides, you can understand what was really going on. Mm -hmm. And so it just kind of helps us shape where we're at now to allow us to go forward. Oh, I like that, Susan, yeah. All right definitely agree with you. Um, you know, when I said history is personal, it is, and history really is, it's the story of everyone um, and how we have related um, as human beings to each other. Um, and, and I know a lot of you are in natural resource parks and, and so it does get a little bit tricky when we do interpretation. It's not just human interaction, it's human interaction with the environment, with the geography um, and that understanding of how it all weaves together. And, and to add on to that, and I'm sure, um, sorry, Autumn, I'll, I think I interrupted you. Uh, but it's it's to also, for us at History Nebraska, especially, we're trying to fill in those gaps because there are a lot of stories that are kind of pushed to the side or maybe not told very often. So that's something that we work really hard to do is to make sure there's as many voices as possible to make it personal to as many people as possible. And showing all sides. Uh, kind of building off of that. Um, so I'm 
small town Nebraska girl from a town of less than a thousand. And so um, cultural and historical interpretation um, were actually some of the first ways that I was able to interact with other people who weren't just like the people in my small town, in the small towns around us. Um, and so I think that cultural and historical interpretation are so important because for some people, that's gonna be their first interaction with cultures, with historical events, with people that are different than them. Um, and it's a really great opportunity for people to really kind of internalize that like not everybody is like me, but that doesn't mean that we can't learn about them. That doesn't mean that they're not just as interesting as my culture or my heritage, my history. Um, so I think that's why it's super important. Yeah, that's really good. That's a good point, Autumn. Um, what, um, so you guys are speaking on a lot of big uh, subjects of why it's important and especially some I'm hearing a lot of, you know, telling different stories, making sure we're representative of a lot of different peoples and histories within the, the narratives that we weave for this work. Um, can you speak a little bit about maybe the process you take when trying to tell a story in a meaningful way, whether that's cultural or historical, what does that process look like. I'm, I'm happy to jump in. This is something my team and I do uh, in terms of our programming. So when we're looking at the museum, we're looking at our exhibits and trying to find that Nebraska connection. When we're uh, looking at our other sites, again, that's, that's a pretty easy Nebraska connection there. But uh, when we look to start telling these stories, we look for the voices that are there. And then again, part of that is trying to find the voices that aren't there and thinking of creative ways to fill in those gaps. And one of the things we do, I mean, um, we're, we're really great at what we do, but we're not going to be experts on every single topic in history. So we reach out to uh, experts, especially in various cultural communities. If we're not familiar, we're going to, of course, try and go to that source. And to piggy piggyback on that, that's kind of what I've done in both of my national park sites, too, was looking at who's there and who's not and what stories told and what what's missing and actually going and starting making relationships with those groups and from there you start to figure out what is missing because if you don't know you don't know uh, but if you start having the conversations with them and just interacting uh, you start finding it and one project we did when I worked at Homestead was that we wanted to learn about the Afri African American homesteaders and we wrote a grant that then was given to the University of Nebraska to research African-American homesteaders in six towns in six states. And we have a historical marker because of that research at DeWitty, Nebraska. Um, but one of the cool things was that there were all six of these towns, six states were connected by the people actually traveled back in the earlier 1800s. I mean, that was a long way to go. But the hidden story that was uncovered through that research and just di deep diving was the fact that none of those towns were meant to last because they were free mm. slaves came out here because and they came as groups because if you think about it, you've been on a res, uh, on res, um, um, plantation most of your life that's all you know so you wouldn't go out by yourself but they come in groups and they were homesteading like here in nebraska they homesteaded all together and the idea was that you got land and with that land you got wealth so your children and grandchildren would have a new an option that they never had. Uh, Susan, yeah, Susan, I just want to share that I just I had mentioned I just drove through the sand hills last weekend where, where my family and I went to the Black Hills. And so we stopped at some of the historical markers and that one that you just mentioned um, that I have never heard that story before. I remember taking a picture of it and sending it to my all my nerdy friends and family um, of the story of the freed slaves uh, having a, a settled town and is it just say D Witty? D Witty. D Witty. And I just like my husband and I had this whole amazing conversation. I'm I'm just saying that was yeah. so cool because I'd never heard that story in school. So thank you for your work. That's incredible. That's right. Cool. And that park just read a different grant. Now they're doing it on the Native American homesteaders. Excellent. So try and re see what else comes out. Um, that's good. So I, I know I heard um, Ashley and Susan, but yeah, that process for telling a story in, in a meaningful way. Um, anybody else want to share kind of what that process looks like for them? Uh, for me, the process has to begin with 
reaching out to that community and building that trust relationship between mm -hmm. us. Um, because in, in many cases, the cultural and historic interpretation um, that I am trying to do is with communities and um, cultural groups that have have a good reason not to necessarily trust me or my organization to begin mm -hmm. with because they've had like historical issues with us or for example they've just felt like um, maybe they weren't welcome for one reason or another so the biggest part of my job and my process is really reaching out and forming these connections and um, developing that trust and letting them know I'm not going to try to co-opt your story uh, for what I want it to be. I want to work with you so that we can represent it in a way that's respectful um, and accurate to your culture and your history and your community and what you think is important. Exactly. And it's all about the relationship building. And then when possible, we bring them to come tell their story for themselves. Mm -hmm. And we've done that. Yeah, Tamara, I, I see you nodding on that. Did you have something? Yeah. Interrupt. I was just going to add to that too. Um, we've all kind of mentioned it, but I think the, the final finishing project on um, when you put an exhibit or an interpretive program together is to find that original voice. Um, it doesn't matter how much I know about a topic, it will always be told um, as a white, you know, middle class female. Um, so it's so important what Susan said is to, to find that voice. And if you have a good enough relationship, um, and there's some trust there, um, bringing them in to tell their story, I think is one of the most pivotal things that you can do um, in historical and especially cultural interpretation. Mm -hmm. And I might also add, it's, it's great um, when you're designing things to make sure you're using those universal concepts. So what um, everyone can can you know relate to so love right you know freedom passion it might mean something different for everyone but we all have an understanding of those terms um so that way your audience relates to the resource because mm -hmm. putting a lot of information about you know dates and and this happened this and here's the timeline is great information to have but everybody learns something differently and in interpretation it's it's building that connection like we talked about with that resource so making sure when you're writing some of those displays you have that original voice but you have some of those universal concepts to tie it in with the audience that's reading those um, resources i like that a lot i mean that's a good point because it seems to me that those universal concepts would still hold true today mm -hmm. and 500 years ago yeah. you know some of the things you're talking about that's really yeah that's good thank you very much um anyone else want to add to the process because i don't want to move us along if you have something else that was really insightful. Um, so we're kind of talking some like high level big picture questions and stuff, which has been great. Sorry, we just jumped right into those ones. Um, but I want to ask a little bit more about the programs that you all work on. What's been a program or a project that you feel has been most rewarding and created an impact in your community or your region? So you, I'd, I'd love to hear from each of you on, on this question if you um, would like to share. I'll jump in. Okay. Um, we started one of the things that when I arrived at this river three years ago is we didn't talk about people at all. So we really started talking about the caretakers, which connect us to the Native American, the fur trappers, the landowners, the homesteaders, the outfitters, and the people who've done it. One of the things that we also did was um, we know that the Native Americans are not coming down to the river very often. And we started working with two of our 21 affiliated tribes in with their, um, it evolved by going to the tribe and asking, do you want to do this? And with doing a, a meeting with the committee of elders found out that they wanted their middle school girls to have this opportunity because the boys have other opportunities, the girls didn't. And so we do interactions with them. And so we're building a relationship with these kids so they see that they belong here. But we also requested that they tell their own culture while they're here. So now whenever they come to visit us or we go there, it's always an elder and the youth. And so the elders are telling their story. They evolved into teaching language when they're along the river. And it is amazing what has resulted in it. Um, 
the relationship with these girls now is really pretty. They've told us that this is their safe space, that there are so many, there's so much um, like sexual abuse that happens around them and they don't, they're taught to be invisible um, so that they don't attract attention. And they have told us multiple times that when they come and they're with us, it's their safe space. They can be who they want to be and they can be themselves. And it's just really powerful. That's incredible, Susan. That's incredible. That's an impact on both of them and your community. So yes. thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Um, anybody else? What's been a program or project you feel has been most rewarding, made an impact? I can go. All right. Um, so my program is still relatively new. It's just started up at the beginning of this year. Um, but we have between... 15 and 20 markers that we're working on right now to um, expand the historic marker narrative and bring in some of these uh, communities and topics that have not really had a lot of space. Um, and this one that I found to be really impactful for me is um, Nebraska Public Media has this very small like 10 ish minute doc like mini documentary on a woman named Kay Cover from Red Cloud. Uh, well, she lived in Red Cloud. I don't know if she's necessarily originally from there. Um, but her daughter approached us about having a, a historic marker about her because she started the first uh, girls softball team pre Title IX in Red Cloud. And she was really inspiring for a lot of women of that time. And she just had this great energy um, that you can see in the documentary, but also in just talking to some of the people who uh, were on that softball team. And I, I made sure to call everyone who was um, who applied to our program to let them know about the status of their marker. Um, and when I called uh, Mrs. Cover's daughter uh, to let her know that we'd approved her marker application, um, she was so excited. She cried a little bit on the phone. Um, she was just so happy and so excited to be able to talk, uh, have this marker that talked about the history of softball in her community and how important her mother felt that that was. Um, and so I thought that was a really beautiful, like, um, local history story that could connect to also um, the history of sports in Nebraska. Yeah, excellent. That's awesome. Autumn, thank you for sharing that. So um, in that same vein, uh, I'm fairly new to this position. So this is a, an ongoing project, but um, next week we are hosting a panel here at the Nebraska History Museum um, on women in business. And so I've, I've been kind of spearheading this. This has been really an awesome opportunity to get to know some uh, folks in the community, some businesses in the community. And we are going to be highlighting kind of a past, present and future model. So uh, Kylie Kinley, who is an educator down in the Hastings area, a while back, she wrote a really compelling paper on Queen Louise, who was a bootlegger during the 1920s. So uh, we are going to have her speak a little bit on women in business and what that looked like 100 years ago. We're also going to highlight Brooke Mullen, who is the owner of Sapon. Uh, it's an ethically sourced, uh, I believe, leather goods store here in Lincoln. And she works internationally. So we're going to highlight her as our present. And then we are also highlighting uh, Carmen Castillo with RC Party Accents, her business has been around for about four years now. And so she's kind of our future and we get to hear about her hopes and dreams for her future business. And uh, this has been really rewarding to get to know these really inspirational women and learn about uh, kind of how life and work has shifted for women in the past hundred years. We're also going to be inviting uh, Tracy Sanford from Sarah Cider. She's gonna do a demo on uh, different ciders, both um, if you're interested and you all can sign up, feel free. Uh, but there's gonna be a alcohol cider option, non-alcohol cider option. So this has been a lot of fun to get me into the community and to uh, invite people into our museum too, to talk about these women that are, again, not super highlighted from the past, we're bringing their stories to the forefront. And again, I'm, I'm giving uh, women today this platform. So this has been a really fun, rewarding experience. It's 5.30 uh, p.m. on November 17th, if you all are interested, and I'd be happy to pass that link along. Oh, absolutely, Ashley, I was gonna ask, because for those in this area, I'd be happy to put that in that follow-up email, because that sounds like a good opportunity and a fun project. 
I think we have a PDF yeah. version of the uh, Queen Louise article that we could share too. Oh, oh for sure. Because yeah. I because I think it was in uh, our our magazine. Yes, we'll pass that along as well. Thanks, Adam. Excellent. Thank you, Amanda or or Tamara. Um, I can go. All right. Um, Ash Hollow is um, in a very remote area. I forgot to mention for people that don't know, um, it's at Llewellyn, Nebraska, which is kind of the, the beginning of the panhandle, kind of our, our tail there. Um, there's been a lot of things that we've worked on that um, I feel like we've, we've pulled some voices out. I can't take credit for everything. It really is an agency's work. Um, you know, for instance, with the Little Thunders and some of the voices um, with the Battle of Blue Water or the Massacre at Blue Water, um, some of the players didn't even know, you know, their history. Um, but I would have to say the thing that I am probably most proud of is um, to come into a park that really hasn't had a, a history of interpretation. Um, it's It's been kind of a sleepy little park, which is kind of crazy to me because our agency does so well with education and we have wonderful programs and we have um, parks and um, different divisions in our agency that do such a stellar job at this. Um, but for me, it really has been building that interpretation program with field trips. Um, our closest school is 20 miles away, probably. Um, and when I first came here, we had about three to four typical field trips that you know they would let them in the museum and they could look around and then they could walk from this hill. And so I really kind of made it my goal to develop that program and talk to teachers. We have so much history here. Um, and I would have to say, I'm pretty proud of that. We're now at above 500 kids a year, which for our area is actually kind of large. That's, that's <laughs> um, incredible. Well, yeah, and it, 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 we can tailor, um, you know, just for example, we had one this morning that they wanted to learn more about blue water. Mm -hmm. um, but then they also wanted to know about the bats and about the cave. And um, I even told Megan Mannery, who's in on this Zoom, that I think it might be the first time that we ever held a class um, with a field trip in the cave. Um, and so it's kind of a lame answer. It's kind of a, you know, no. not anything super spectacular, but the fact that we're building and becoming a presence um, with programming um, within this area. Um, I have, I have field trips all year round now. It's not just in the spring and, you know, not just when they're getting out of school, but um, teachers know that they come, they can come to Ash Hollow and we can teach them on a certain topic and it's, it really makes me feel good. I'll have to tell you, I uh, was in fourth grade. I lived in Tryon, Nebraska, so McPherson County. And that was our end of the school year. I went to a two room elementary school, K through eighth grade. And that was our school field trip for the last day of school was to go there <laughs> a million years ago. Wow. <laughs> and we um, remember it, we remember it. <laughs> and one thing that might be a little different from environmental education and interpretation, um, you know, we have classroom programs like Tamara talked about, um, and a lot of times with environmental education, we have a captive audience, right? The, those school kids are going to be there. We're maybe teaching standard-based learning, but with interpretation, um, you know, it might not always be a captive audience. If somebody doesn't like your program, they can leave like in the middle of it. And it might be more family groups and things like that. So um, to include interpretation in some of the, the, the field trips that are coming out there um, is great because they get to hear those stories firsthand in the resource um, and in the place where those events happen. So creating that meaningful connection with the resource um, like I said, it's just slightly different than environmental ed, um, and the, the, the way to, to teach it might just be a little bit different, but, um, you know, getting those kids involved in interpretation at a young age is, is always a great, um, great thing to do. So we just, to piggyback on that, we just did our first, it's taken us three years because we planned, hit a pandemic and finally got to do it, but we did our first creative, um, right the river creative writing float where we used a Nebraska writing project, which is part of the national writing project, but that pairs 
English teachers with park staff who know the resource. And we took kids on canoes and we stopped in different places where like along the cliff and you learned about geology and you learn it um, a different writing style. So they were learning four different writing styles, four different resources. And the interpretation that we build into that was what was really cool because we used a lot of dialogic questions of really making them think about things and what could this be, you know, and then we also did mindfulness, making them just sit and take in everything around them. But the writing we got from them as we debriefed at the end was phenomenal. It was just amazing. And the experience that they had, they connected to this river. All of these kids had grown up around the river, but they'd experienced it in a completely different way than they'd ever done before. It made more diff it made a difference. That sounds like that sounds incredible, Susan. I want to be on that field trip. <laughs> and I like how uh, many each one of your answers has um, so many different kind of disciplines and aspects within the bigger uh, the bigger kind of mission of what we're all doing here, which is, you know, even I, I like I enjoy like Tamara and Amanda speaking about weaving in even the history of like the natural resources around as well. Um, and working with schools and working with the communities and partners, I think, yeah, what what awesome work you all are doing. So that's very exciting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm going to move to a different question for you. Um, one of the questions is how do you approach and you might have touched on this a little bit, but this is a good conversation. How do you approach those topics that are maybe more hard to discuss in cultural and historical interpretation? That's one of the things that we, the Park Service, does a lot of. Okay. Um, and so basically we stick with the facts, present all sides, the facts of all sides, and then leave it open to, and using open-ended questions so people can think and make their own judgments. And then if they want to ask more questions, and that's what's the hardest on that interpreter, because that interpreter's got to know a lot of different things about it because they have no idea what's going to come at them. But if they know their resource well, it's super powerful because let the visitors kind of be a part of what your program is and give them you know, the basics and then let them start asking the questions of what they want to know more about or their own ideas and judgments about what they believe from what you just taught. Yeah, and to, and to pick it up. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, go for it. Um, I was going to say to piggyback off of what Susan said, um, yes, I absolutely agree with that. Um, but I think the, the real trick, and, and the rest of you can speak to this too, this is something that I am learning, um, especially having that classroom education background and moving into interpretation, is that your vernacular, um, your words that you use when you talk to people are so vitally important. Um, you want to create a safe space where all voices are welcome. You want to um, also let them know that no matter where they're at on you know their their circle of historical understanding or cultural understanding um that it's okay to talk about it number one um but that your voice is also um it's respected and that i like to leave people with i can always learn something new from them you know i have my own perspective um but there's not probably one day that i haven't walked out of ash hollow where i haven't learned um, to think about something in just a little bit different a way or wow, I never thought people, you know, considered that when they're talking about um, perhaps maybe the Blue Water Massacre. Um, so I think language, you know, we, we can talk about what interpretation is and we can talk about um, presenting it, but I think the most fundamental thing is when you are talking to other people it is really the language that you use and in, in the environment that you create for them within those conversations. That's excellent. I was, I was going to say something pretty similar there, um, just in terms of working a, across a spectrum of audiences, because um, and any time during my day today, I could be speaking to, you know, really young students, I could be speaking to lifelong learners, and having that language and being able to scaffold that is absolutely essential. And that's something that I, I try to do too. I don't want to shy away from these topics, especially if it is a heavier topic talking with perhaps a younger audience, as long as you have that language, you have that knowledge base, uh, you can still foster some really important discussions while also remaining age and context and content appropriate. 
yeah, these, this is that's very excellent. Um, some good food for thought there on that because we're not going to not have difficult or topics to present on. They're always going to be there. So how can you kind of, um, I like what you said, Tam Tamara, uh, create that environment for really inclusive perspectives on that. And I think that's kind of a summary of um, what you shared. So thank you so much. Um, let's see, we have, so this is a cool question we had from the audience. It's a little bit of a direction shift, but I thought it was a good one. Um, someone asked, what are some easy and effective ways to integrate the cultural history of Nebraska at nature centers or nature education programs, which is a great, that's a great question. I think, I think we're all moving to a space where we're thinking about things not in its own silos, but more the holistic approach of education interpretation and how it all kind of influences each other. So I really love this question. Any ideas um, for this one? We might have some folks that work at an actual nature center here on I, I, can, I can go Amanda, yeah, 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 hey hi um i work at the wildcat hills nature center in scotts bluff nebraska and i think um like tam alluded to earlier we do really good on like this is a coyote this is a fossil um and a lot of times it's it's digging a little deeper and finding those voices that aren't represented and finding some of the um the, the cool little tidbits or, or cool stories about it from a different perspective. So, okay, let's talk about the moon during a night sky program, but let's tell a story from a, a different group of folks and how they utilize the moon and what the moon phase means to them and, and everything like that. So it's adding that a little, taking it up a notch, taking not only just the basic information, but turning it into the interpretive piece and, and creating that, that connection with the resource through different avenues, whether it be like a story or, you know, um, different things along those lines. So um, that's, that's what I think is kind of cool. And I think as, as a, an agency, that's the direction we're kind of taking it. Um, and a lot of our places, we, we've got that knowledge and we've got that information about the, the resource, but let's connect it to the people and the stories of the past. And that's where you relate the untold stories. That's where your relationships come in. That's where you learn the stories from it. Um, and even just the land has always had people on it. So look at who's been on your land and make connections back to them. Um, and an easy one too is even you know, we did the bi a buffalo trunk, and it has the pieces and parts of the bison. And but we don't just show this is you know the leg bone and this is what it does. It's yeah, uh, this is how the Native Americans would have used it. And I, I learned that program from a Lakota woman. Um, and that's the first thing I say is that I learned this from Lakota. So I'm sharing their knowledge. And so you can respect their knowledge of how all these parts were used, but it doesn't become the parts. It's each part has a story of what it did and how they used it and how it helped life. And then you start seeing the picture of what life was like. And then, then it becomes powerful and then people can kind of start connect to it. And you can do the same thing with, we did the same thing with um, pioneer chores. Yeah, it's picking up eggs, but what did that egg meant? Well, an egg meant you had enough money to buy material so you could have a new dress or you could buy sugar so you could have something sweet. Um, just taking it to the human connection part. That's good, thank you and so I much. Think, you know, I don't think there's really any part of, of nature that doesn't have a human connection with it. Yeah. When we look at this historically, um, the development of humans has been how they have manipulated nature. Um, and that is also how I feel where our job gets very, very hard. You know, we're expected to know a lot about a lot. Because <laughs> um, I, I was a little bit intimidated by how much natural history was in Ash Hollow. And I started thinking about it, you know, all of those connections are there. We just need to do the work to dig a little bit deeper to find them um, and to let people know about them. Um, but when we start thinking about it in more logical ways, you know, it's not so hard. It is quite easy. Um, for example, what Susan was talking about, it, it's there. Um, we just need to think about it a little bit differently than what we've traditionally been taught. I like that you mentioned that traditionally been taught, Tamara, because it's something I think about a lot is um, often, um, and I, I hope that we're moving towards, again, a more holistic approach, but often it, we have a dichotomy of humans and nature and that separation. 
and and the idea and the understanding that we are part of the natural world we're part of nature weaving those stories together gets a little easier um, when you just kind of think of it through those lens so that was good very good well i hope that was that question was answered um sufficiently for the folk the person who asked it um great question another question that we have um from the audience is and you guys touched on this a little bit so maybe just um like in a in a quick way how can i respectfully share a story that is not mine um you did touch on it a bit but um I'll interpret that as maybe it's not my cultural story to share, but I still want to make sure we elevate that story in this space. So just some good advice on that. So if I could go, yes. um, I think that first, the main thing you need to do is just acknowledge to yourself and to your audience that it is not your story. It is not your culture, et cetera. Um, and to be upfront about the fact, both again with your audience and with yourself, that that means that you're not going to know everything about it. You're not going to understand all the nuances of it. Um, and so by that nature, your information is going to be um, forever incomplete. Mm -hmm. And that's okay as long as you are acknowledging that and understanding and trying to do right by it. Um, I feel like as long as you are making an effort to understand what you're trying to say, you're acknowledging that you aren't ever going to be a complete expert on it and that it's not really your story and you are um, seeking information and understanding from uh, the sources of this, like the cultural sources or the um, community sources for this information, for this culture. Um, I think that's kind of the best way to go about it, um, to make sure that you're being respectful, that you're um, able to share those stories, but in a way that acknowledges that they are not necessarily yours. Mm, that's good. Thank you, Autumn. Anybody else? Yeah. The first easiest one is invite them to come tell it themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. And I know that can be difficult sometimes if you don't, that takes relationship building and that takes, you know, even understanding and being aware of who's there to tell that story. So that's a, pro a long process, but it's a worthy one. That's good. Thanks for sharing that, Susan. Um, Real quick. And I yes, also think you else. have to dig a little deeper too. Um, and we've tell, talked about that. Sometimes when you research a story that isn't ours, you really need to dig in and, and find both sides of the story if it's a, if it's a conflict or something like that. So because um, a lot of times, as we know, um, some stuff, it gets, you know, down there ways in the Google search or wherever mm -hmm. you're looking um, and, and making sure you, you do dig a little deeper and, and not just go with that first gut reaction like, oh, this story is on top. So I'm going to share this one um, would would be my recommendation too is to find out as much information if you can, if that firsthand um, person can't come out and present, but, you know, find, find out, don't just Go with the first first story that you come across. Um, you know, do your research and dig mm -hmm. just a bit deeper. That's good. Thank and you. and to that point too, I've I've run into situations in in my experience where sometimes you are going to get those questions thrown at you where you've acknowledged like, "Hey, I'm not an expert," but um, just just being okay with saying, "Hey, I'm mm -hmm. not an expert on that," and being able to maybe go back and reach out to the communities that would have the answer or do that research and maybe get back to that person if you are able to answer those questions. But yeah, part of it is also feeling at peace and okay with being like, "I I don't know," yeah, that's and good. it's it's okay to say I don't know. Yeah, that's really good. That's a growth that's a growth point there for people, and I think. Um, it's not always it's not easy for everyone to be able to say I'm not an expert in something you know we a lot of what we've been taught is uh, we have to be we have to know you know we have to be expert on things so that's very good thanks Ashley um, anybody else on that one we don't want to miss anyone's voice okay um, so this next question it's a little personal and then also thinking about um, you know anyone interested in this field so I'd love to hear from each of you, if you don't mind, what brought you into this field? What what brought you into this career field? And then with that, maybe um, advice for someone interested in going into this career field, kind of like a personal reflection and then advice, if you'd like to go. I'm, I'm happy to start. Uh, so I'm, I'm originally not from Nebraska. I was born and raised in Wyoming, and I'm 
kind of an interesting case in that I have known what I wanted to do since I was probably about in the fourth grade, like hitting those those fourth grade field trips that I'm now leading, which is kind of a cool full circle moment. So I've always wanted to work in museums. I've loved history. I've loved social studies. And so I, I followed that career path up until right this very second. So um, it's it's been a really fun, rewarding thing to be able to work uh, in in local history, that's a little bit my specialty. So wherever I've bounced around across the nation, I've been able to kind of dig in and get to know these local stories and these local histories. So it's it's just been a passion of mine and I'm very, very fortunate that I've been able to take that passion and turn it into a career. That's excellent. Thanks, Ashley. And any advice for uh, folks who are wanting to be in this career? The little, yeah. <laughs> the little next fourth graders. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's it, my my best advice is is go for it and continue to try and find those those jobs and those research opportunities and uh, really start kind of networking if possible because that's that's been a, a huge portion of my career is kind of getting to know folks in this field and seeing how you all can work together. But yeah, if 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 you like what you do and if you like this field, um, you can totally make a career out of it. And so again, it's keep striving, keep pushing, because I mean, it's it's a little competitive, but totally worth it. Thank you. Well, I can go next. Um, I was trying to combine my, I have a business administration degree to start with, and I was a credit analyst in a bank right out of college. And, um, but I, I didn't want to work with paper. I loved history and I loved working with people and I loved learning about people. And so I ended up being able to get into the National Park Service as an administrative assistant, which then I moved right after that into the, the Ranger series and I worked my way up um, into the superintendency. But along the way, it's, um, and it, it's the greatest job ever. I, I love what I get to do, um, you know, Part of my job is to go float that river so I know what's out there, I know what's happening. And, and, I, and I get to train in some of the most beautiful places in the country. So it's a great career field. Um, recommending to get, and it is hard to get into some of these, but I would volunteer and then I would ask for a mentor that's within the National Park Service to help guide you because the application process even within the National Park Service is very difficult and it helps to have somebody teach you what you need to know because um, just answering some of the first questionnaires that you get in USA Jobs, if you answer it wrong, you might have just knocked yourself out. Um, and everybody says your resume should be two pages. My son's graduated from college being told that, not in the Park Service. Um, they want great detail because they're looking to make sure you qualify and they're looking for the detail for, and you, each job is different for what they're going to look for. But the more you give them, the more option you have for actually making the qualified list. So, and be persistent, but go out and talk to people and may, and get the mentor and volunteer time. And there's a lot of internships that they're considered not paid, but they get a $250 a week stipend and it's free housing. So it's pretty doable to get some good experience doing that because you're working right alongside the rangers doing what they're doing. That's good, Susan. Excellent. I like your, you got in kind of sideways story and then worked your way up. That's good. excellent. <laughs> Very good. Anybody else? I can go. Yeah. Um, I started with um, historical education, you know, formal public school education. Um, and I was a little bit like Ashley. I was you know, in elementary school, just loving all of the history um, and my social studies classes. I, I blame my grandma for that. She didn't tell me Three Bears, Goldilocks and the Three Bears stories. You know, she told me about Paul Revere, the Boston Tea Party, or, um, those types of things. And so it really fostered um, my love of learning for um, people and cultures, especially. Um, but I got a little bit of a push, I think, with the public education system. Um, I taught a lot of advanced placement classes. And I always question, you know, why do we have these canned objectives? I think naturally, I just kind of um, leaned a little bit more towards interpretation. Um, 
And I got really lucky um, when we decided to, to move back home. Um, there were luckily positions open at historical parks with Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Um, and so I, I was scared, um, but I took them and I wish I would have done it, you know, 10 years ago. It's, it's a great agency to work for um, because of the resources that it has. Um, but when you get into the historical sites and you're allowed to do interpretation, um, you can really immerse yourself in the history, in the culture. Um, and so it, it, it's been a great move for me. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy I did it. Um, you know, the, the other ladies might know a little bit better, but it sounds like Susan and I kind of came from different backgrounds, at least we were kind of on the right track maybe, and then just got sidetracked into um, interpretive positions. But I think- it Sounds my, like your heart was in the right track and then you got there. It was, it just mm -hmm. took a little while to find it, I guess. But um, my advice would be never stop learning. Mm. Um, you know, we all have a passion for something. Don't get so bogged down into that one, that one topic. Um, read a lot, learn a lot about everything. I think this goes back more to making that historical and cultural and natural um, interpretation mesh together. I never, for example, never once would have thought that I would want to learn about bats. Guess what? We have bats. <laughs> so all of a sudden, you know, it, it becomes my job. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the more that you can learn and the more that you can understand um, how the natural world um, fits in with the human world and the animal world, I think that would make for a pretty rounded um, career choice for interpretation. That's um, good. And I'm probably the newest, the newest one here. So um, that's my newbie advice. I like that advice. Thanks, Tamara. Autumn or Amanda? I can go. Um, so basically how I kind of ended up here is um, I went for both my um, bachelor's degrees and my master's degree at the University of Nebraska Kearney. And just kind of by the nature of the program we have there for history, um, it is a little bit more public history focused. Um, so I kind of went through purposely a little bit more academic focused um, as far as the things that I chose to do. But just by the nature of the program, I ended up with a lot more uh, public history experience than I would have necessarily um, at a different organization a different institution. Um, and one of the things they had us do was we did a couple different internships. Um, and because I was kind of always around, I got um, to be one of those people that the faculty recognized. So they were like, okay, Autumn wants to do this. Autumn likes this. Um, let's have her participate in this activity. Uh, let's have her intern at the GW Frank Museum, which is my background. Um, if you have time, they're now open on Sundays and you can go see my textile exhibit there. Um, super cool, uh, but things like that. And so because they knew I was interested in working with different cultures, different communities and peoples, um, and also that my personal interest was lesser discussed stories in history. Um, my first love is always gonna be material culture and women's domestic labor. But um, when they saw this job was available, they were like, hey, we would really like you to apply for this. We think you'd be great at it. Um, so I kind of ended up here because I had a lot of really great mentors who were um, looking out for me and were kind of like, okay, you have this experience, here's a thing you could do. Um, and it will also be great because you have kind of like a magpie brain where I like this shiny thing and this shiny thing and this shiny thing. So this is great because I get to look at a lot of different things all at once. Um, so I don't get bored. And so my advice would probably be to try a little bit of everything. And if you can, um, find those good mentors that are gonna look out for you, that are gonna be like, hey, there's this class that I think you'll really enjoy and it'll learn, teach you a lot. Or, hey, there's this job that's gonna come up. Um, let me help you get your CV ready so we can send it in when the, when the job listing pops out. So I think that's kind of my advice there. That's good. And also I really appreciate the magpie brain reference. I didn't know I had a magpie brain also, but now I do. So thank you so much. Um, Amanda? Uh, so I came at it from the natural resource side. Um, I was working for a nonprofit doing education work in the panhandle. And my boss and mentor was like, hey, you should, you should really look into 
a class for um, National Association for Interpretation, a certified interpretive guide class. Um, and that kind of opened my eyes to some differences in what interpretation is um, and, and how that compares to what I had been doing in environmental ed. Um, and then fast forward, I don't want to date myself a while, okay, and um, really enjoy teaching others about interpretation. So I went and got the next step um, and got um, certified to teach the, the next generation of interpre interpreters. Um, so checking it out, um, you know, there is a National Association for Interpretation that is based out of Colorado, but um, that's a great resource. Um, and then just traveling and seeing um, other people present as well, other interpreters out there. Like I learned so much from Tamara's talk on the Battle of Blue Water. Um, it was amazing in that emotional connection um, that is built and seeing how other people present that information um, is always, always great too. So, um, you know, getting out there, seeing what other people are doing um, and just, trying it out, you know, getting those internships, seeing if that's what you like, you know, maybe you get out there and you're like, eesh, presenting to the public isn't quite my jam, but I really like the display aspect or something like that. Um, so just, you know, getting out there, trying some different things um, and and seeing what you like and, and seeing what stories aren't being told out there. And is there a gap somewhere um, that, that you can you can fill in that information for people? That's excellent. Thanks, Amanda. And I really like that uh, learning from others too. And I will say not to not to put a spotlight on you, but I spent three years out in the panhandle of Nebraska and um, it's where I met Amanda. And I that was that was a huge help for me to just learn and watch her do her interpretation programs. It was incredible and helped me so much even in my career. So I love that we all kind of kind of learn from each other um even even someone who has less experience you know than me i've learned some i've learned i've learned things from right like we'd all do things a little differently and i think a lot of the things that we were talking about today are you know just including those um voices and those experiences and how we can really learn from each other about our histories and stories so excellent this, this is great i loved it um any last thing we have a few minutes left so i might ask you one more question but we'll just do kind of a quick round are you guys ready for that Okay, so this might be hard to do in a quick round, but um, there's this one last question. If you could create a dream cultural historical program or just a topic that you would love to teach about or program with no budget constraints, so don't limit yourself, okay? Uh, what would it, what would that be? <coughs> that's hard. I'll give you a second to think. I know that's too hard for a quick one. Is that too hard, Amanda? I know. Okay, Autumn's ready. She's okay. ready for her elevator speech. Okay, so um, this is a little bit more personal interest research than like what I currently do now, but if I could do any sort of like cultural heritage interpretive program and I would have no budget, I would want to do one on the variety of textile um, like heritage in Nebraska and the different cultural aspects involved with it and the different ways that different communities and cultures in Nebraska have either brought their textile um, traditions to Nebraska or adapted them based on mm -hmm. their living here. Because um, I'm, I'm a huge like fiber arts nerd. Um, so I knit, I learned to spin wool the other day or yarn the other day. Um, so, cool. so like, that's like, I think it would be so cool to have a whole bunch of examples to bring in people who were from those, who are from those cultures to do speeches, to do demonstrations, um, to have activities where they could like have resources available because I'd want it to be very accessible because mm -hmm. I think that's one of the issues that comes with interpretation sometimes is that it it's accidentally inaccessible to people who maybe don't have a lot of ability to move around um, to like come to Lincoln or Omaha or don't have a lot of excess money that they can put in these. So I'd really love to make it like a free activity as well. Um, and okay. so I think it would be really great. Excellent. Really and you were ready with that one. I like it. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Everybody has thought about this before, so we probably have our canned ideas. But um, I think if I could do anything, I would I would want to create an oral history um, preservation center. Um, I oh, work yeah. quite a bit just with Ash Hollow. Um, a lot of cultures don't have books and written histories as mm. oral histories. 
Um, and, and even with our older folks, you know, there's a, a lot of old timers, for instance, that live around the area. Um, they all have all these just wonderful stories to tell. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if I could create anything in, in this area in Ash Hollow, it, it would be a way to um, preserve, to collect, um, and then to later on share um, the oral histories of, of everyone. That's good. That's a, such a good point, Tamara. Thank you. And a great canned, ready to go idea. Anybody else? We're kind of piggybacking. <laughs> We're piggybacking on that. We're kicking off an oral history project this winter. And part of it is with our Native American tribes because many of them aren't their oral tradition. So how to collect that, but also um, the landowners and how, it's, how they have changed shape, made, um, kept this land in the pristine condition that it is. Mm -hmm. Good. But I'll throw That's another good. cool challenge out there. Um, yes. When I worked at Homestead, um, we were, you know, we studied, you know, over half of Nebraska was homesteaded. And so if you start looking at the names of the towns around our state, you can see where a lot of these homesteaders came from because of the towns like Cairo's. Um, they were, they, all these places were homesteaded by people from those areas. And I often go through those towns and wonder, does anybody know anything about those people that came from those countries that settled right here? Is is it just the name of the town left? Is there anything left? Yeah, any connection? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good curiosity. Yeah. Ashley? Yeah, I've, I've got one written. I have a whiteboard. Right oh, I love it. Where my screens are. Um, I would love to do an exhibit or an interpretation on Nebraska and pop culture. Mm. So a different, a different form of cultural interpretation, but one that would be so fun to research on because Nebraska is truly like we're everywhere. So, you know, we can talk about Johnny Carson and his impact. We can talk about someone more contemporary like Gabrielle Union. We can talk about Loma, Nebraska, and the fact that Tu Wong Fu was filmed there. There's so much uh, that we could do with that. So uh, that, would, that would be a fun way to pull in different people, different stories, and connect it to all over the state. So that's my, that's my little dream board that's above my one. screen here. That's fun. I like it. Ashley, I need to introduce you to my mentor because he teaches a class on Nebraska and the world. And I think you would get along. <laughs> please, please do. <laughs> that would be awesome. Excellent, Amanda. Any any dream? You have a lot of dreams. I know this. Right, so right. sorry yeah, for right the Right now, because it's it's around my lunchtime. I would yeah. love to deal something with 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 the food, right? Yes. And and, and um, the history behind some of the the dishes and and everything like that. And um, so that's not really probably going to happen at my nature center. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, since I I have unlimited resources, right? We could be cooking <laughs> some of the the you know native foods and yes. You know, we got to get a kolache in there somewhere because i feel <laughs> like like we need to represent you know um, I yeah i also think food is one of those universal concepts that you spoke of earlier you know right so, gonna that, be relevant, so that's that's my my dream someday love it that's amanda great. i've got some good news for you history nebraska we are currently in the middle of uh putting together a food exhibit exactly on what you just spoke about so looking at uh, native cool. american food ways up to immigrant food and culture up to you know 2022 so uh are we going to be able out. to taste it that's the thing that i want to take you know i want to eat we're kolachi. putting in a kitchen yeah I will, oh, that's, that's awesome so, that so cool. that's everyone just keep your eyes peeled in the next year or so we're we're working on it we're, i'm going to hold you to that that cool. sounds like a good one. Um, I know we went about five minutes over, so I apologize for that participants. However, I do think that we had some amazing discussion today. I want to just thank again all our panelists for taking your time today and sharing your expertise and your experience. Um, I know I learned a lot and I hope everyone else did too. And I hope it's also just, you know, it's not the end of the learning, but the beginning. We're thinking about some of these concepts that you brought up today. Um, Again, thank you for participating today and chiming in with your questions. I'm going to be sending out an email, hopefully tomorrow, with a link and evaluation of this webinar and also everyone's contact information. If you have more questions, you want to follow up with the great work that these incredible women are doing across the state. So again, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Day. Bye. Bye.